From the idea that the self is not given to us, I think there is only one practical consequence. We have to create ourselves as a work of art. When we think about plastic surgery, something like Jack Squidward might come to mind, or maybe we'll picture Jessica Owls, famous for being the former human Ken doll who underwent over 60 medical procedures and spent roughly £630,000 to appear more masculine, only to realize that those procedures hadn't actually made her happy because she was actually, in fact, a woman all along. Today, I want to talk about transition and surgery from a specifically non-binary perspective. I want to talk about the wider philosophical concept of changing your body and undergoing surgery. I want to talk about my own relationship to surgery. And I want to talk specifically about what options exist for non-binary people who want to explore a unique medical transition journey. Nature versus bodily autonomy is at the center of a lot of left versus right discourse. Thanks to the lovely institution of religion, there's a belief that God created us a very specific way and that when we change our bodies, it's an insult to God. Now this line of thinking obviously benefits some groups more than others. The fact of the matter is, the way that you were born can give you certain advantages in society. So obviously for somebody who has those advantages, it's very easy to say, love yourself the way that you are but for those of us who maybe have more disadvantages, we might say, well, that's nice for you, but I wanna change some of these things about myself. I got a comment recently on my channel from somebody saying that trans people are anti-feminist and pro-capitalist because we advocate for changing our bodies and changing other people's bodies to conform into certain standards of beauty and conceptions of what it means to be a man and a woman. This is a position that's held by quite a lot of gender criticals or TERFs. The idea is that to change your body, you have to be anti-feminist. To be a feminist, you have to advocate for the message of love yourself the way that you are. Opponents of trans-related surgeries say that we are playing into capitalist systems that are trying to sell us an idealized version of ourselves. And they're not completely wrong. Gender affirming surgeries are a huge booming industry these days. The thing that they get wrong is that, well, they always have been. <laughs> Cisgender people are the biggest consumers for gender affirming surgeries in the world. They get more gender affirming surgeries than trans people. I mean, just look at Elon Musk. So proud of his transition. So very brave of him. So blaming trans people for perpetuating capitalistic ideas around beauty and for being anti-feminist is scapegoating on a massive level. And arguably, trans people have an even better reason to seek out these gender-affirming surgeries in the first place. We just also happen to be doing it the least. <laughs> when I've spoken with members of my family about wanting to change certain aspects of myself via surgery, they've just absolutely hated this idea. And they said, why don't you love yourself the way that you are? Now, I am a huge supporter of loving yourself the way that you are. It is something that I strive for in my own journey and it's something that I encourage in others. And I recognize that it's something that comes easier or harder to various people. But I also believe so strongly that it is fundamental to any principle of human freedom to be a staunch proponent of bodily autonomy. That means that if we want to change our bodies, we should be allowed to do so and we shouldn't be treated badly for it. I recently made the decision to launch a GoFundMe on the internet asking for money for my transition. I feel super cringe for this. However, there is a link to the GoFundMe down below. If you do feel inspired to donate something, please feel free to do that. When I shared my GoFundMe on Facebook, I had a family member comment and say, transition to what, question mark? You're already beautiful. And the thing is, I actually agree with her. I think that I am beautiful, and I think that I was beautiful before I transitioned as well. But the thing is, when I get tattoos, it's not to cover up the skin because I hate the skin underneath. It's because getting tattoos brings me joy, and also because it helps me to create myself anew, in the words of Foucault, as a work of art. And my transition is exactly the same. There are trans people who will tell you that you should only ever get surgery to alleviate dysphoria as a medical condition, and I cannot tell you how much that is false. You should and should always make whatever decisions you want to make about your body for yourself, for whatever reasons are best for yourself. 
That isn't to say that you shouldn't rigorously challenge whether or not a medical procedure is right for yourself. I think you should, and medical procedures are a very big deal. They come with loads of risks, obviously. I'm not saying go out and get whatever surgeries you want, chop your arm off if you want to, go crazy. That's not necessarily what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you have the rights over your own body. This is your space, you own this thing, you get to make the rules. <laughs> There are also those out there who say that we are putting a burden on society by seeking out gender-affirming treatments. And it's true that in some countries, there are some governments that provide a very small amount of translated gender-affirming surgeries, which technically some people are going to be paying for out of their tax money, an incredibly small amount for an incredibly small number of trans people. That said, like, I feel guilty even setting up a GoFundMe and asking for money because I know that there are bigger issues in the world. I know that there are people who need money to survive and, that makes me feel bad. I'm like, oh gosh, people's survival is obviously more important than my gender affirmation. But this is an issue with capitalism, not necessarily an issue with trans people. Capitalism creates a culture that is hyper selfish and hyper individualistic. The reality is there are way more unfilled homes than there are homeless people. The truth is we as a society could feed everyone, we could house everyone, we could take care of every single fundamental need that every single person needs to survive and still Trans-related gender-affirming surgeries would make up an absolute infinitesimally minute fraction of society's resources to be provided for, and we could still include that, and we could do everything, we could do all of these things. We're simply not, because we live within capitalism. But if we wanted to structure society that way, we could. I promise you, trans people are not the problem here. Please, read some Conquest of Bread, develop some class awareness. We're not the issue. Okay, so people should be allowed to change their bodies if they want to. That's bodily autonomy. But that doesn't mean that we can't also simultaneously advocate for self-love and supporting people loving themselves the way that they are. And ideally, we wouldn't live in a society that pressures people to change their bodies just to achieve happiness or success or safety. It's totally naive to pretend that many of us aren't pressured into changing our bodies and conforming to especially Western capitalistic ideals of beauty. And these pressures can have devastating consequences. There's a huge history of people getting dangerous, cheap plastic surgeries to be prettier, to be more successful, and ending up dead or with severe health problems. I think people should have access to safe, healthy ways to change their bodies if they want to, while also knowing that that isn't the only path towards living a happy, fulfilled, and successful life. And I want that for trans people too. But trans women in particular have an additional challenge that they face with pressure to get plastic surgery, and that's safety. Trans women are some of the biggest victims of extremely violent hate crime, and undergoing facial feminization surgery to successfully pass as a cisgender woman, as well as undergoing bottom surgery and potentially other procedures, makes us safer in society. It means we are less likely to be noticeably visibly trans, and it means that we are also less likely to be victims of extremely violent crime. And that is a horrible, terrible, sad truth. Ideally, this shouldn't factor into our decision-making at all. The only thing that should factor into our decision on whether or not to get life-altering cosmetic surgery is, will this make me happy? And the answer can be yes for a multitude of different reasons, whether it resolves dysphoria or produces euphoria, or simply because you want to be prettier and it helps you achieve that, whatever that looks like for you, and you want that for yourself. I want to also mention the whole current culture war surrounding trans-related surgeries. On one hand, you have people who think that all trans-related surgeries are the devil and wholly unethical and completely evil and rotten and bad. And on the other hand, you have normal people who can see nuance in things and recognize bodily autonomy. Detransitioners sometimes say that they were pressured into surgeries that they later regret. And as a result of this, there's this huge movement saying that all trans people are pressured into surgeries and that all trans-related surgeries are carried out in unethical ways. The reality is that anybody who undergoes any kind of surgery to change their body, whether they're cisgender or transgender, there's a possibility that they will have complications medically and that those complications will be bad. 
and there's possibilities that they simply will not like the results, and there's possibilities that they will like the results temporarily, but later in life regret them. That is a possibility with any kind of surgery that anybody gets, whether they are trans or cisgender. Now, it is a well-documented fact that the regret rate for trans-related surgeries is incredibly low. Approximately 2% of trans people who undergo trans-related surgeries end up regretting those surgeries. It is very unlikely that trans people are going to regret the surgeries that they undergo. That is just statistically unlikely. It is simple probability, baby. The truth is most people that are undergoing surgeries are not regretting them. That is the fact of the matter. Now, right-wingers like to take that incredibly small statistic of 2% and make this absolutely enormous issue out of it. That isn't to say that we shouldn't care about the 2%. There are plenty of incredibly low statistics that we should care about in society. I personally care that detransitioners have undergone surgeries that they regret. That matters to me. I feel bad that they are unhappy with the results of these decisions that they have made as consenting adults with their own bodies. I will still, however, defend to the death their ability to get those surgeries because I believe in bodily autonomy. There's also this idea that when you learn about surgeries, you then want them. And right-wingers say that this is a bad thing because what's happening in their eyes is People are learning about these things, and then all of a sudden, that desire is implanted into their brain, something that they previously didn't even know existed. Now, this is true. This happens. What ultimately caused me to transition was learning that non-binary people were able to medically transition. Previously, I had a rough concept of trans people and trans medical transition, but I didn't know that it was possible for non-binary people to want to seek out medical transition. And when I found out that that was a thing, I immediately was like, oh my god, this is me. Now, just because learning about something can produce a desire to change yourself does not mean learning about things is bad. In conclusion of part one, bodily autonomy, baby. That's what it's all about. We love bodily autonomy. It's fucking great. And it should be at the cornerstone of your ethics. It's important. It's so... It's so important. Alrighty, let's talk about surgery, baby. <laughs> There are surgical procedures out there which I have only myself very recently been educated on that exist for a more non-binary medical experience. Now, I'm saying that these are non-binary medical paths for transition, but the truth is these are just surgeries that anybody can get for whatever reasons they want to. I think we can get very hung up on describing absolutely everything to do with medical transition through a trans-specific lens, but the reality is any kind of medical process can be for anybody. If you want to take hormones and you identify as a cis man, go off, my dude. Do, go for it. If you are a cis man and you want to get a vaginoplasty, hello, okay, you know what? I support you. <laughs> <sighs> I just had to change the light battery like 10 times while filming this because it gets dark so early. I have to use unnatural lighting and I haven't filmed a YouTube video in ages and I don't know what I'm doing anymore. And um, <clears throat> I'm very professional. All right, hopefully this light lasts long enough for me to get through part two. <sighs> Please send me your thoughts and prayers during this difficult time. <laughs> okay, first off, I wanna talk about a penile preservation vaginoplasty. This is like the most exciting surgery that I ever found out about because when I found out about it, I was like, oh my God, I want this so bad. Just to be clear, this is not currently what I'm fundraising for in GoFundMe. I just think that it's amazing. And it, this is, now this is something I literally know that I've always wanted for as long as I have been alive, but just never knew it was a possibility. A penile preservation vaginoplasty is essentially bottom surgery where a vagina is created on an AMAB individual. Um, the vagina is created out of scrotal tissue, as well as potentially if there are other parts, if there are more tissue needed, they can take it from other parts of the body as well. It then preserves your penis, so you keep your penis and all of its function, you can still engage in penetrative acts as a top if you want to, you can still have all of that function there, um, you reduce any kind of risks associated with your urinary tract because all of that is preserved. So in general, this surgery has less complications associated with a full vaginoplasty, um, and it obviously, you keep your penis. So you, you have quite literally two different genitals. You have a vagina, which you can be penetrated from with using, and um, you also have a dick. Hello? How cool is that? Anyway, I just think this is really interesting and really great. Orchiectomy is something that some 
trans feminine non-binary people may seek out an orchiectomy is the removal of your testicles. This can be a really great way to get your testosterone levels to be incredibly low forever <laughs> for the rest of your life, not having to take T blockers. But additionally, it can be quite euphoric for trans and non-binary individuals because it means that we don't have to tuck as much. There's kind of a lot less there. It can make your body feel a lot more feminine without having the complexity of a vaginoplasty, which is a much more intense surgery. Facial feminization surgery might seem like a really obvious thing to bring up here, but if you are non-binary, that doesn't mean that you can't access surgeries that are traditionally known as being for binary trans individuals. So if you want to pursue facial feminization as a non-binary person, you can go to a facial feminization clinic and you can say, I'm non-binary, I would like more androgynous results, and they can talk with you specifically about the individual procedures because facial feminization is a series of feminizing procedures that are performed on the face. Um, oftentimes they include a jaw reduction, maybe a chin reduction, um, forehead bossing, which is kind of getting rid of some of the bone that a lot of AMAP people grow on their foreheads. Um, it often includes rhinoplasty or hairline contouring as well. So facial feminization includes a lot of different procedures. And for a non-binary person, maybe you'll want just one of them. Maybe you'll want all of them. Maybe you'll want some of them, but in slightly different ways. Another term that might be useful for non-binary people seeking medical transition who are AMAB is demasculinization instead of feminization. So as a non-binary person, you might not necessarily be seeking feminization at all. Maybe you're seeking androgyny or maybe you're seeking demasculinization. If you are non-binary and you are AFAB, you can also seek out facial masculinization procedures. That's often a lot less perceived because testosterone does a lot more to masculinize the face, but maybe you're non-binary and AFAB and you don't want to take testosterone, but you still want to have a slightly more masculine face. There are loads of options there for you. As an obvious disclaimer, I am an AMAB person and that tends to dominate a lot of my perspectives here just because I've researched this a lot more extensively and I can also speak through the lens of my own experience. So I'm not trying to exclude AFAB people from this video. I made a whole video about why I want to minimize even the very usage of those terms and categories, but obviously my lived experience is affecting the content because that's just the way it works, I'm sorry. Another surgical option for AMAB non-binary people is also just a full vaginoplasty. So it is completely valid for you as a non-binary person to pursue vaginoplasty for yourself and remove your penis as well and to get a vagina. It is completely valid if you want to pursue that for yourself. There are a lot of trans femmes who identify as boys with vaginas. Um, that's completely valid. Whatever surgical options you want to explore for yourself are valid. You don't need to identify as a woman to want to undergo a vaginoplasty procedure. That is just whatever is right for yourself and for your journey. On the flip side, if you are AFAB and you want to seek out bottom surgery, it does not mean that you have to identify as a man. You can want to have bottom surgery without identifying as a man. Top surgery is something that you may want whether you are AFAB or AMAB. Top surgery is something that is available to you as a non-binary person. I know a lot of non-binary AFAB people who have undergone top surgery, but it is also possible as a non-binary AMAB person, maybe you've undergone HRT and you've decided you actually do want a flat chest, or and maybe you, I don't know, didn't use raloxifene, although for the record, you can use raloxifene if you're starting HRT and you don't want to grow boobies at all. Um, but likewise, you can want to get breast implants and actually have a huge, massive chest as an AMAB person as well. And so you might also seek out chest modification in that way as well. However you want your chest to look does not necessarily have to have anything to do with whether you are a man or a woman. You can be non-binary and want massive mommy milkers, and you can be non-binary and want to be totally flat chested. It's allowed a small titty girls are valid. If you are non-binary and AFAB, you might seek out a hysterectomy. A hysterectomy is the removal of your uterus. I know that the removal of the uterus has been euphoric for a lot of AFAB trans people and um, having a uterus does not have anything to do with whether or not you are valid as a woman, it has nothing to do with womanhood at all. Um, and equally you can have it and be valid in your non binaryness but maybe you want to remove it and maybe that'll be gender euphoric for you. Maybe a desire to remove it has absolutely nothing to do with gender because these are all medical procedures that don't actually have to have anything to do with gender at all. Okay, this was not an exhaustive list at all. I definitely encourage you to do some of your own research if you want to explore other options that can exist out there for non-binary medical transition. I'm going to put some of my own resources down below as well that go into a lot of non-binary medical transition paths in more depth. And again, I apologize that 
I am a little bit more heavy handed on the AMAB information side of things. Um, if you are AFAB out there and you want to educate me on themes and want to see more perspectives uh, out there, I would love that. That would be really cool. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. I'm sorry I have not made as much content lately. I've been really busy transitioning. If you also want to follow my journey with transition, I tend to post about it quite a lot on Instagram and that's kind of like the main place I do post about it. So if you're missing me not making as many videos recently, um, I still post quite a lot in there and I also stream semi-regularly as well. So there are loads of places to stay connected with me on the internet. And don't worry, I'm not quitting YouTube. I'm Goodness gracious, this is the third time the fucking camera's died on me. <laughs> This is why, this is why, am I gonna burn myself? This is why I'm, this is why I'm not making videos anymore. No, I'm just kidding. Um, if you miss my videos, um, I'm sorry, I'm still making them. Um, I have like so many scripts planned for the new year, um, but in the new year, I don't know what's gonna happen to me. I might be like recovering from surgery for a while. You know, life's complicated. Things are going on in my life. So um, we'll see what happens. I need to get a new visa for myself. Things have been kind of stressful in that aspect. Um, so just, you know, just understand that like, I'm still very passionate about this channel, but life is doing that thing that life does. Um, so yeah, thank you for watching. <laughs> I don't know how to do YouTube anymore. This is, this is, mm. I think I'm just gonna, I th I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go now. Thank you, goodbye. Oh.